All right, Dad, what game are we playing today? Today we are playing the Undercity. As you can see, it's a nice thick box. Plenty in here. Plenty of uh, pieces out here on the map. Plenty of miniatures. Even more hanging out here behind me that aren't in this particular scenario. But whew, it's a cooperative adventure game where we all work together to accomplish some objectives and beat the bad guys. It's kind of cool. Do you like it? I do. I like it. Uh, there's a number of things that uh, at first I was kind of taken back by. Um, for example, the map. When I looked at it, I thought, well, that's kind of plain compared to other dungeon crawls. All these tiles are really just protect walls. But after I got playing the game and realized the type of play it is, that it's not necessarily going out and discovering new things, but more about just a battle arena of hashing back and forth between the good guys and the bad guys, it works out pretty well. So... Yeah, I think it's a it's a great one, and uh, it may look overwhelming when you first look at it with all sorts of stuff out there, but it's actually a, a simplified uh, gameplay mechanics, which I actually like. It's kind of refreshing. It's cool. So what's the objective of the Undercity? Well, the objective is different in each of them. There's multiple scenarios, or they call them chapters, but the best way to do it is through a campaign. In addition to the rule book, you have a 23-page campaign book to say, and you'll do different chapters, and each chapter will have a different setup and different objectives. So, for example, the one that I have set up here is Chapter 5, Safe Passage. It shows you which villains are going to be in play, shows you how to set up the walls, different gates. There's going to be different terrain tiles, for example, here. Other scenarios may have different things on their tiles. Um, back and forth, there's all sorts of things. And it'll tell you, based on the number of the tile, where to set them all up and tell you what the objectives are, and then you're off and running. Cool. And uh, you win the campaign if you win, if you beat every chapter. There's seven chapters. If you lose one of the chapters, game's over. So anyway, uh, it's a lot of fun as you progress because the coolest part is as you progress, you're going to level up. So for example, here we have character abilities and abilities deck, and you're going to buy special abilities during the game that will cost you a different amount of experience points where you can level up between chapters, which is what it's all about. As you get your get your heroes, you get them leveling up uh, throughout, gaining XP and moving on up, getting more powerful because the villains are going to get more powerful as you go as well. So it's the progression that makes it fun. So why don't you walk us through some gameplay? All right. Well, first thing I'll let you know is we've each got our characters. So, for example, let me show you here with Milo Boggs, his character. We're all going to start out in this scenario here. You got a number of different things, a number of different statistics. Their vitality, their strength, their intellect, perception, defense, armor, as well as their initiative. They've got different weapons. So he has a melee weapon and some ranged weapons. He's got some special abilities, another special ability. So things that that person will, will remember. And again, those may look overwhelming, but they're particularly not. His vitality says he's six, which means he gets essentially that much health. When he takes damage, he'll turn it over, and that will represent wounds. As I already mentioned, the ability deck, and then everybody has a feat deck, and there's three feats that are set out uh, for each character. Two different abilities during your turn, during your gameplay, you can activate uh, either one or the other on a card and discard it. And then at the end of your turn, you'll draw back, well, you'll draw a card. You can't ever have more than three feats to be able to use at a time. So essentially, you've got Milo there. We've got a bunch of other guys here. We'll put all the heroes out on the map where we're all working together. And as you can see a difference here, there's big spaces, big sections. And the best thing to know is how you're going to get around. You can't have more than seven miniatures in one space, including villains and heroes. The other thing to note is always in these type of things is based off of range. So what they refer to here is connected spaces. And connected spaces are anything that doesn't have a wall around it, which these represent walls. For example, this character is here. He has con a connected space or any of these where there's not a wall on the side or even the corner. But since there's a wall touching this corner, these two spaces are not connected. So to get from one to the other would be one space, two space. So some simple things to remember. All right. So the first thing you do, this is played in rounds, where every hero is going to get to take their turn during a round. First thing you do is flip over an event card, and I'll show you these cards over here. There is a big event deck, 
there's even more event cards but each scenario tells you which event cards to use so there's different numbers on the cards so different events are in different place to start the round you'll flip over the event and it'll tell you special things that happen in this event so first for example in this one place two sword thugs and a crossbow thug at a random passage the other thing you'll notice on the event card is it's a red card there's going to be others that are blue it's going to be either blue or red and that's to help determine priority order for some of the villains when they activate. So after that round is set, the player order is determined based off of initiative. So in this case, the highest initiative is going to be Canis. So she's going to get to go first and take uh, her actions, and then it'll go down in order of initiative order. So she'll go first, then it'll go on down to Milo, Pog and Doorstop, and then to Gardic. So that's the turn order the heroes will take. So she can go what she does on her turn, First things is she spawns the villains, which means she's going to roll a dice to see which villain gets spawned, as well as a dice to where it comes out. We like to roll two dice and say the white dice is the villain that spawns. So for example, in this case, it's going to be these guys. And red, since there's one of each, red for this event is going to be the one that comes out, and he's going to come out in spot six. Had I rolled a two, three, four, or five, Wherever there are most of, he's going to come out. So the blue would come out. After she spawned villains, now she gets to move and take actions. So what you can do on your turn when you're moving, you can either stay put, in which case if you stay put, then your ranged attacks, you get to roll an extra dice. It's boosted. Or you can walk, so she could go one space. Or you can charge. You can go two spaces and do a melee attack in, uh, in that spot. But in this case, we're just going to have her walk one. So after she has moved to her location where she wants to go, then she can use, she can choose melee weapon or ranged weapon, and you'll get to use all of your weapons of that case. In, in her case, she's just got one ranged and one melee. So she's going to go ahead and use her ranged weapon, and she can choose one of these powers with her ranged weapon. I'll say brutal this time. The attack gains a boosted damage roll. So let's say she wants to go ahead and attack this blue sword thug. She's going to look at the blue sword thug's card. We'll bring it over here so you can see it. And this will tell you his vitality, strength, defense, and armor. So vitality, essentially, he's got one heart. So when he takes one damage, he's dead. So what she's going to do to attack is she will roll two dice uh, for her weapon. She's got range of two, so she can go ahead and hit him. And an accuracy of four, so she's going to, or accuracy of five. So she roll her dice, she got four, and then you add the accuracy of five, so her accuracy is nine. His defense is 12, which means she didn't even hit him. Now, had she rolled better, let's assume, there we go. She got a 10 plus an accuracy of five, that makes 15. And she's higher, equal to or higher than the defense, then she scored a hit. See if that person took damage. So in that case, you're going to look at power. Uh, and with her Brutal, she says this attack gains a boosted damage roll. So now we're rolling for damage, had she hit, of course. We get a boost with another dice. We will roll three dice. So there you've got 10, plus her power of 8, puts her at 18. Now you'll compare their armor, and she definitely caused some damage. If it's four or less uh, in excess of the armor, it's one damage. But since she rolled an 18, which is six more than his armor, he's going to take two damage. Of course, he could only take one damage before he's dead, so had she hit him, then she rolled that damage, then he would be gone. He's not dead, he would just go back into the reserves. Okay? But in this case, we know she didn't even hit him, so he didn't die, he's still out there. And that was her attack, and that's how attacks work. Then at the end of her turn, what she's going to do is turn over one of the villain action cards to activate a villain. And this one it says, pressure point. Activate the four villains closest to you. And reshuffle the villain action deck after discarding this card. So, first you're going to do that. The four closest to her are all four of these. Which is great. So then the question is saying, which one is going to activate first? Which one's going to work first? For that, we will look at the color of the round. So red's going to activate first. So this guy's going to go last. But here we have three different types. To know which one goes first, you'll look at these tokens here. 
that we did before, like when we were spawning them. One, so he's going to go first. So he'll activate first. And then it's going to go to the, the sword thug and then the crossbow thug. So that's essentially the order that they're going to activate in and they're going to start attacking. So what does it mean when a villain activates? Let me show you. We've got a cool handy dandy card that shows what they do on their turn. And there's going to be a bunch of symbols. So for example, this guy goes first and he is going to, what's cool about this, this is where the villains or the overlord if you want to call it that way, where the villains are going to go in order of their icons, left to right. The first one that they're able to achieve is the one that they do and then their activation is over. So in this case, this one says melee. It means he'll first try to attack a hero or an enemy in the space that he's in. Since he's not in any space, he's not going to do that one. This next one is the rush. So he's going to go up to two spaces, ending his movement in the target space, and thereafter do a melee attack. So he can. So he's going to go two spaces, end it in the space with an enemy, and is going to do a melee attack. And so what you can see on his, his card, or his melee weapon, he has two melee weapons. So he gets to use them both. So first he's going to roll his two dice. He got a 9, plus his accuracy puts him at 14. If we go ahead and look at hers... Her defense is 13, so she got hit. So now he's going to roll for damage. Wow, 11 plus 7 puts it at 18. Her armor is 12. That's more than 4, so she takes 2 damage. So flip over 2 of her wound markers. So she took damage. Whew, that hurt. Well, he's got a second melee weapon, so he goes again. 6 plus the 5 puts it at 11. Her defense is 13, so he did not hit that time. Okay. So his activation is up. He won't go on to the next one because he already did one. Now we'll go on to the Sword Thug. And the Sword Thug will activate the same type of way. We'll go ahead and take a look at that. He'll attack someone in a spot. No one's there. And he'll rush. So he comes over here and attacks. He just has one sword. And 7 plus a 4. Doesn't make enough to beat her defense. Doesn't hit. So he's back out. Then the next one is the Crossbow Thug. Same type of thing. And that's what happens on that player's turn. Let's put those reference cards back. So that was her turn. So as you can see, it goes back and forth between the heroes and the villains after, well, on each player's turn. There's a lot going on, a lot of moving around together, but it's a big arena battle, defeat those thugs. Every time you defeat a villain or cause a villain to take damage, you're going to get an experience point. That's what these are here. So the experience points go into the bank, so as you keep defeating these or damaging all of these villains, even though they'll be coming off the map and coming back into play, you're going to be gaining experience points along the way. At the end of the chapter, you're going to divvy this out evenly, and then everybody's got their experience points that they can use to buy special ability cards, like we talked about before, to level up their hero and get more, more power. Sounds Whew. fun. So that's the basics of it. There's other, there's other chapters, other scenarios that come into play with uh, big, some of these big baddies coming in after a little while when something else is activated. Some, some bosses will come into play. Um, in this scenario, as I mentioned, the goal is to get Ambrose to the other side. To do so, you have to close some of these gates that are there coming out. Then you've got to come over here and you actually have to move with him to escort him to the other side. So knowing who to go after which uh, monsters, who to bring him along, how to close the gates. There's a lot of things to talk about as a team and figuring out. But every, every chapter is a little bit different, a little unique objective. Whew. But that's the basics of, of how you play the Undercity. All right, sounds good. What would you rate the Undercity? Oh, that's a good question. I would rate it a 3.8. I think it's a very good uh, mechanism. One of the things that I like best about it is that we're all on the same team. When I've played other dungeon type games, it's usually I'm the overlord and all the boys are coming after me as the heroes and I'm, and I'm tired of getting beat down all the time and feel like they're teaming up and I'm always being fought against. In this case, I can play with my boys all on the same team and really let the cards and the dice dictate what the villains do and so we can really 
uh, work together, collaborate a little bit. We know each other's abilities and feats to know who should be taking out which monsters, who should be going to help out, who should be closing gates, what they, what they could be doing. And really, you could go ahead and create your own maps, create your own decks, bring out your own villains and see how they're going to work together. Um, it's really open-ended in that regard. So it's kind of cool that way. It leaves uh, some creativity, but definitely a lot of dice rolling. Uh, thumbs up. You got to check it out. All right. Thanks, Deb. Thank you.